it's good for us to begin with the reading of the psalm. Uh, psalm 148. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights. <laughs> Praise him, all his angels. Praise him, all his hosts. Praise him, sun and moon. Praise him, all stars of light. Praise him, highest heavens and the waters that are above the heavens. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for he commanded and they were created. He has also established them forever and ever. He has made a decree which will not pass away. Praise the Lord from the earth, sea monsters and all deeps, fire and hail, snow and clouds, stormy wind fulfilling his word, mountains and all hills, fruit trees and all cedars, beasts and all cattle, creeping things and winged fowl, kings of the earth and all peoples, princes and all judges of the earth, both young men and virgins, old men and children. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is exalted. His glory is above earth and heaven, and he has lifted up a horn for his people. Praise for all his godly ones, even for the sons of Israel, a people near to him. Praise the Lord. Well, uh, let me say something about where we are in the book of the Psalms. We're in the, the last part of uh, the book. How many, do you remember how many different books there are in the Psalms? Uh, they're divided up into five books, and uh, we just began studying in the second one recently, but this is the, this is the last one, Psalm 148, it's part of the, the fifth book, and uh, you can see from the, the note here that uh, this is in a subsection called the Great Hallel, the Great Hallel, Hallel is the Hebrew word for praise. And uh, so when you have that word, uh, sometimes our, some versions actually start Psalm 148 with hallelujah, which hallelu means you all praise. Hmm. It's a, an imperative, it's a command. And then yah is the short form of the name of God, Yahweh. Uh, praise Yahweh. So beginning from Psalm 146 to Psalm 150, every single one of these psalms starts and ends the same way. Let's do, let's take a look at that. Go back to Psalm 146, and uh, and notice with me verse one, uh, verse one, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, O my soul. So in Hebrew it's Alleluia, Allelu, and then Hallel, and then praise the Lord, O my soul, uh, is not Hallelujah because that's singular there. But but then look at verse ten of Psalm 146, the very last phrase, praise the Lord. And then the beginning of 147, praise the Lord. Look at the end of Psalm 147, at the end of verse 20, praise the Lord. <laughs> and then 148, we just read, look at Psalm 149, verse 1, praise the Lord, is how that begins. And then at the end, verse 9, praise the Lord. And then Psalm 150 is hallelujah on steroids. Uh, <laughs> praise the Lord, praise God, praise Him, praise Him, praise Him. And it just kind of rattles out. And then at the very end, verse 6, praise the Lord. So uh, this collection of psalms is called the Great Hallel because it's a great, a great collection of praise <laughs> hymns. They're all hymns of praise. Um, and, they're, and they're intended to inspire the people in their worship. Now, did you notice that in all of these, if you look back, look back at Psalm 146, look above verse 1, there is no heading. There's no heading. There's no saying who wrote it. And the same is true with 147, 148, 149, 150. None of them have a title to tell us who wrote it. They're not by David. Uh, are they by the sons of Korah or someone like that? They might be, but it's, an, it's odd that they're not listed there. Uh, it, it's believed that uh, most of these uh, psalms are written when there is no temple, or at least some of them are. Like Psalm 148, which we just read, there's not a single reference to the temple. Now that's really striking because the temple is the place where, when there is a temple, the praise of God is supposed to be localized. I mean, that's supposed to be the center of the worship of the Lord. 
But what do you do if there is no temple? <laughs> Let's say you're in the days of Daniel, uh, or, uh, or even, even after uh, that. You know, wh what do you do? If there, can you not praise the Lord? Well, no, you still can, but you're, the way you orient your praise is going to be different. You're going to be thinking not so much about the God of Zion, but the God of all creation. And, he, and even maybe in a far-off place like Babylon, you could still praise the Lord. In fact, you'll notice up here uh, in the author note, there is an old tradition that says that Daniel's three friends were the composers of this psalm. Now, we have no way of knowing that. That's what the, the Apocrypha uh, says. So, so the Apocrypha has some things in it that are valuable and some things that are you know, kind, of, kind of iffy. The, the word Apocrypha means hidden, and that meant that even in ancient days, its value was kind of mysterious. Like, where did this come from? And what, how good is this or not? No. <clears throat> Heard, I remember uh, hearing that after the temple was des destroyed that, that the, the leaders um, got together in a conference like and tried to decide what are we going to do and that's when they came up with the idea of a synagogue. You yeah. Hear anything like that? Well, the synagogue, that's right. The, you know, there's no synagogues in the Old Testament. There's no gathering in lo local places. There's one authorized gathering place, and that's at Jerusalem at the temple, or tabernacle or temple. But what do you do when you don't have a temple anymore? What do you do when you're not even in the Holy Land anymore, but you want to hear the law? You want to praise and pray? So they began, I mean, synagogue simply means gather together. Hmm. It's a gathering together. It's It's... It's, it's really not very different from an ecclesia, a gathering that's called together. Um, so they would begin, it seems to be during the Babylonian exile and afterwards, Jews who don't go back home, they start to gather together to, they can't do sacrifices. Um, what can they do? What would God allow them to do? Well, they can read, read Torah. They could have Torah taught. They can pray and sing. And so um, they start to have weekly meetings. Uh, and then when the Jews go back to Israel, they kind of keep up that practice. Even though the temple gets rebuilt, they keep up the synagogue pattern because they have found that to be uh, useful. Wow. In fact, the early church's meetings, remember the early church is primarily, the earliest stage of the early church is primarily Jews, so Christian meetings kind of modeled themselves after synagogue meetings. Different day of the week, eventually. Uh, but the reading of scripture, the teaching of scripture, prayer, praise, and things like that. So uh, whether this was intended for the synagogue or not, we can't say. But uh, it is fascinating that there's not a, all the praise that's going on, not a single reference to Zion. Uh, or there's a reference to the people of Zion, but there's nothing said about the temple. Yes? When they went back out of captivity, back to Jerusalem, they had to start all over again. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. They, they didn't know the Torah. That's right. When they went back. And most of them, most of the Jews who go back don't even know Hebrew anymore. Hmm. So when Ezra stands up to read the Torah to them and to make them aware of all the things that they've not been doing for several generations, uh, <laughs> he has to translate it. So when, the, when it says in Ezra that he read from the law distinctly and gave the sense, gave the sense means translate it. Because most of the Hebrews were speaking Aramaic at that time, not actually Hebrew. It's a similar language, and they could pick up a little bit, but it, it's not quite the same. So, um, yeah, there was a lot of, I mean, a lot of informing and teaching that had to go in. And so they start off simple. They just rebuild the altar first, and then it's some decades before they actually start building the structure of the temple itself. Um, but despite all of that, all of those downers, God is still worthy to be praised. Uh, he's worthy to be praised everywhere and by everyone. And that's <coughs> what this psalm talks about. This psalm, the, the type of psalm, is a praise psalm for sure. I mean, there's no prayers. There's no requesting of God. There's no lament. Uh, there's, you could say there's thanks, but it's not for any particular kind of uh, thing that the Lord has done. It's just describing how worthy God is uh, of praise and adoration. There is a creation motif. Motif is a fancy word for theme. Uh, there's a, a strain of thought that runs. Look, notice how many different elements of the creation are brought in. All these things up in the 
high heavens and all these things and the lower heavens as well as on the earth. Uh, all of that is uh, called upon uh, to praise God. Well, let's look over at the purpose statement uh, for this psalm. The psalmists, and I, I don't know if it's more than one author or not, but I have an S there I should probably take out. Uh, the psalmist acts as a great worship leader calling all aspects of creation to worship Yahweh for his power and grace, especially as it's demonstrated to his people. So maybe we could say that there is a title to the psalm. There, uh, normally the superscript, the headings, will say a psalm of David or a psalm of thanks or a, 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 a miscal we saw last week, a song of instruction. This one doesn't have anything like that, but the fact that 146, 147, 148, 149, 150 all start with hallelujah, that actually is a header. That is a, the, the heading, the superscription. It's a universal call to praise the Lord. Yes, Frank. What would be the possible idea of these last songs uh, for the perfect writing were unknown? Because the last Why, why would they be associated with that? Is that? Oh, just that they lived in a time when there was no temple. I mean, during Daniel's captivity, the temple in Jerusalem is destroyed, and another one won't be rebuilt for, well, a long, long, long time, uh, not in, into the next century. Uh, so, but that doesn't mean they can't praise God. So there's still ways that they can praise God and ways they can be thankful to him. Yeah. And again, I don't know that his three friends did that. It's an interesting idea that they're the, the writers, but I, I would guess it's somebody like them uh, if it's not them in particular. So there is, a, there is a heading of sorts. It's this universal call, just like all the, uh, the four psalms around it all have that same heading. The psalm breaks up into two parts. Verses 1 to 6, this is the praise of Yahweh descending from heaven Everything in verses 1 through 6 talks about things that are up there that ought to praise God. And then, interestingly, starting in verse 7 through verse 14 is everything that's down here that ought to, to praise God, the praise of the Lord ascending up from the earth. So the psalmist is kind of like a, kind of like a choir director, almost. And in the, in the first six verses, he's calling on all the things up there to, to praise the Lord. And then in the next uh, seven verses or so, he's calling on everything down below to praise the Lord. And, and interestingly, the last thing he gets to is people. Hmm. Uh, and that's really his target. Because, you know, the sun, the moon, the stars, uh, they don't really have a voice. You know, they, they do glorify God in their own way. But his, his, his call to them is kind of uh, imaginary in a way. They're not really going to respond to him. The only beings that will, could respond to him are the ones at the end, people uh, of, of every kind, no matter how high or how low, they need to praise him. So that's where he's headed. He's, he's not so worried that the moon is going to stop joining the choir, <laughs> you know, but he's going to, by pointing out to these different things, he's going to suggest to us how worthy God is of praise from even the most magnificent things. So let's take a look at uh, verses 1 through 4, where the, there's the call to things in the heavens to praise the Lord. There's a heavenly focus of that call. Look how verse uh, 1, praise the Lord, praise the Lord from the heavens. And then everything from verses 1 to 6 is about things in the heavens. Okay, So that's the heavenly focus of the call. And by heavens, it doesn't mean... Uh, necessarily, it doesn't mean, just mean the, the abode of God himself, but all of the, the, the layers of uh, things above the earth. Uh, now, he, he does begin in verse 2. The, the highest things uh, up above us are the angels themselves. Verse 2, praise him, all his angels. Praise him, all his hosts. Angels and hosts, these are really the same kind of thing. Hosts is a word that can mean army, but it, it can also just mean a great throng, a great number of, of, of uh, persons who are uh, gathered together for something. Now, uh, it, it's a little ironic for us, for, some, for a human to be telling angels to praise the Lord, because obviously that's what they do. That's uh, that one, one of their great tasks. 
but he's not putting himself in authority over them at all. He, in fact, he's, he's trying to, in, in a sense, he wants people to see that there is a praise of God that goes on unceasingly in the highest heaven and that we need to, in a sense, engage in with that. Yes, Frank. When the Bible talks about the Lord of hosts, God yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's a title, the Lord of Hosts is a title that speaks of his power and that he has a whole array of forces on his hand. That's right. Um, yes. We're taking a lot of your time. But no, that's fine. I have a smaller handout. So. I, uh, <laughs> I, let's see. I, I knew a fellow once a long time ago that he was Catholic and he talked about what went on in the Catholic Church, and I think, I thought, that they called the bread um, in, you know, what oh, we call communion, host. Yeah. a host. Yeah. I think that they're using it in a totally different sense. I think it's something like the, the bread is the thing that uh, hosts the, the presence of Christ. I think mm. that it's not, it's not in the, uh, mm. the sense of a, a, a great host of things. Yeah. And that's where they get to partake of the body? Oh, well, no, that's just one of the words they use to describe how uh, what they think is that his body is there within the, within the bread. The bread is hosting the, his presence. Um, but uh, back to this verse, the, the angels, the hosts, you know, there is an unending uh, cycle of worship going on in heaven. And it's not boring and repetitive. You know, one thing we learn from the book of Revelation is that there are... There's these great outbursts of praise, but it's not always the same. It's not like a broken record. You know, there's variety and there's richness that's going on. And one of the things that's exciting is that when we gather together as a church, when we meet together in worship, there's a, a small sense in which we're joining in with heaven. You know, we're kind of tapping into the unending song, as it were. And we don't sing perfectly. We're out of, and I don't mean vocally. I just mean our worship is not perfect, but we're tapping into something that's, uh, that's eternal. Uh, so he calls on the angels to praise the Lord. So no matter how powerful angels may be, no matter how much greater they may be than us, they are not so great as to be freed from praising the Lord. There was one angel famously who thought he was exempt from this, wasn't it? One and a bunch of others who followed him. And um, uh, Lucifer, uh, a fallen one, well, we know what his end will be. He uh, usurped tried to usurp the place of the Almighty One. So the heavenly creatures, the greatest of them all, uh, are obligated to praise God. And then, now, now we go into verses 3 through 4, and he's going to talk about the inanimate creations. That is, inanimate. These are parts of creation that are not living, thinking beings. Angels, by the way, are persons, aren't they? They're not human, but they're persons. God is a person. Three persons. Right. But uh, angels are persons. But now we come into verse 3. Sun and moon, stars of light, highest heavens, waters above the heavens. These are not, these are not persons. They're not thinking things. They're inanimate uh, cre creations of the Lord. And, and they can be pretty impressive. I mean, who of us could, can withstand the sun? Uh, we hide ourselves from the sun. We shade ourselves from the sun. And then the moon and its mysterious movements, sometimes bright, sometimes dim, sometimes seen, sometimes not. Every day, though, every day, there's that big thing seen all around the world. I remember um, when uh, hearing about Charles Spurgeon, uh, great Baptist preacher of the 1800s, when he was uh, a little boy, he had to live away from his parents for some time and, was, and his father told him, you know, whenever you uh, come to miss me at night, just look up at the moon and know that I'll be looking at it too. And we have this one point of contact, you know. That's a, that's a big thing. I mean, all around the world it's seen. And yet that thing's so much bigger than us. And until, what, 50 years ago, we'd never even been there. Uh, that thing is made for the glory of God. Uh, then, yes, Frank. Um, these terms about uh, the sun and the moon and all that, could that be metaphoric expressions to, uh, to describe worship? Everything worship God. Well, yeah, sure. He's he's taking some of the most obvious things that are in the heavens, but the things that are the things that dominate our life. The, they, I mean, our whole day is dictated by sun and moon. You know, our calendar is dictated by that. But uh, it's bigger than us. It commands us in a way. The, the Lord created both of those things. Genesis one. 
yes, these aren't living things, though. So the Lord made those things, Genesis 1, to rule the day and the night, mm -hmm. uh, and yet they themselves are governed. They are obligated to give praise to God. And Psalm 19 teach, Nobody, teaches us... Nobody's ever been able to say that they made the morning. That's right. Yes. It turns on the, that morning as a light every morning. Yes. Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> So these things, the sun and the moon, and then we move into verse 3, the, uh, the end of verse 3, the stars of light. These things uh, praise God, but in a different way, don't they? They, they don't have, uh, Psalm 19 says, there are no words, their voice is not heard. You know, they don't, they don't talk. They're not animate things. But their line has gone out through all the earth. There's a sense in which they have this voiceless testimony to the power. If, if those things exist and govern us, how much greater must be the one who made them, mm -hmm. who governs them? And then verse 4, uh, more of the inanimate creations of things above. Praise him, highest heavens and the waters that are above the heavens. So this, we're getting up now into the upper edges of our atmosphere, where our atmosphere connects with uh, the universe beyond it. Uh, those things that are so far, for an ancient person, I mean, there was no getting up there. There was there, no catapult was going to get you out of orbit. <laughs> that was just an impossible kind of thing, an amazing thing. And here it is stretched all across. No matter where you went in the world, there it was stretched all across. High thing, but made by God, not greater than God, obligated to give praise to God. And then now we'll come to verse, verses 5 and 6. These two verses explain why the Lord is worthy to be worshipped. There's the call to worship, and now here's the reason for worship in verses 5 and 6. The first thing that's mentioned is his incomparable power to create in verse 5. Uh, Let them praise the name of the Lord. Why? For he commanded, and they were created. Well, nobody can do that. Nobody else can do that. Command? What, what are we talking about? Genesis 1.1. 1, 1. Let there be light and there was light <laughs> it's an amazing thing we learn in genesis 1 there is a god who's there from the beginning and he's a god who speaks uh, he communicates and the very first thing he communicates is he actually speaks things into existence uh, so everything is subservient to him he's no one else can do i mean we can make things but we have to start with something you know, uh, even, even if you're doing, creating things on your computer that aren't tangible, you have to start with software and hardware and, and ideas that have come way, way before you, but not with God. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for he commanded and they were created. And then verse 6 talks about his faithful preservation of the creation. This is a, another reason he's to be praised. He has also established them forever and ever. <coughs> He's made a decree which will not pass away. Now, the phrase forever and ever uh, in, in the Hebrew Bible is, a, 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 it's, I'm going to call it an elastic phrase because it depends on where you are as to what it means. It, I think the translation here, forever and ever, is actually a bad translation in this spot. Sometimes it does mean on into eternity or for endless ages. But other times it just means into the unforeseen future. In fact, the word forever in Hebrew means something like, um, uh, it's from a verb that means to be hidden. So the idea is, so far as I can see, this folk, uh, it goes on. Now that, it might turn out that that means eternally. God is described with this word. He exists, olam. But there's other things that aren't, for, no, we're told in the scripture, both the Old Testament prophets as well as New Testament prophets, that one day there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. And, and the whole system of things that we have is going to be remade. So when this says he's established them forever and ever, does it contradict the, the promise that there'll be a new heaven and a new earth one day? But what it means is that the general order of things is it's going to stay the way it is. You know, we're, we don't have to live our lives in fear of the great asteroid that's going to kill us all and wipe out life on earth. Um, uh, he's made a decree which will not pass away. You know, kings, rulers, presidents, congressmen, mayors, all the way down, they make decrees and then someone else comes in and undoes the decree. Uh, or they make a decree and they can't enforce it. 
Um, but not so with God. With the, the commands that he made in Genesis 1, they have been, even, even after the flood, the flood didn't undo it. There were some alterations. But the decree of God that sun and moon would govern the day, that there would be times and seasons and years, all of that keeps going. And that's, it's God's faithfulness that does that. Mm-hmm. And, and, it, you know, things, and I don't mean by this to imply we could never make them, we know that we might not cause problems. I mean, if there's ever a nuclear war, we're going to have a whole lot of problems. But it's, it's not going to end the, the cycle of things. We have to think about, you know, in the days of Jeremiah, for instance, Jeremiah, the godly prophet, warned Jerusalem for decades that the wrath of God was going to come on them, that, that <laughs> Jerusalem was going to fall to the Babylonians, and they wouldn't believe him, and finally it happened. And he survived. He survived and he suffered through all of that. He was a survivor, and you read Lamentations, and he's describing in poetic terms just the utter chaos that everybody is in after the destruction. I mean, there's even references to, you know, you had slaves who survived uh, the onslaught, and now they've sort of become like street gangs who are uh, marauding and, and take, abusing other people. It's, it's other, you don't know where your food's going to come from. You don't know if, if you're going to be invaded again. I mean, everything is in peril. And it's right in, the, right in the middle of that, he says. It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed. His mercies are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Every morning, every single morning, there are new mercies. Because the Lord is sustaining all things. Praise the Lord. And uh, so it's, it's just raising for us to do that too, isn't it? <laughs> not, just the, not just the creation, but for us. So this decree that there's an order to the creation, this is something that the creation is obligated to give praise to God for. Now let's go to the second half of the psalm. The second half of the psalm brings us closer to home. Uh, beginning in verse 7 all the way through verse 14. This now talks about things in the earth that ought to praise God. So here's the praise of Yahweh ascending from the earth. So if the psalmist is like a choir director, he has now turned to another side. Uh, this is not a choir that's over here and over here. This is a choir that's up here and down here. So now he, he didn't have the, they didn't have the tons back then, but if he did, uh, he would be aiming down there. So just like the first half of the psalm begins with a call to things in the heavens to praise, now there's a call to things in the earth to praise the Lord. Uh, notice there's the, the earthly focus of the call, beginning in verse 7, praise the Lord from the earth, as opposed to verse 2, praise him, uh, the end of verse 1, praise him in the heights, now it's praise him in, from the earth. And uh, the, the first thing he brings up is things out of the fiercest environments. The places where we don't, as humans, like to go. Uh, we don't like to go down into the deep depths where the sea monsters are and all the deeps. Sea monster is, to, is a, this is a, a broad term. It would include whales. It would include giant squid. It would include anything. It doesn't have to be a mythical creature at all. Uh, great beasts, great creatures of the deeps. This is the base of the choir that is being summoned. <laughs> Here. And of course, you, you, you have to remember the story of Jonah, where there is that, that great fish who was appointed by the Lord to uh, rescue the prophet, and there's one who uh, obeyed. I just finished teaching Jonah at the seminary again, and it's fascinating that in, in the book of Jonah, there's, there's a number of references to animals. The, the first is the big fish. Uh, it could be a whale. It, it says fish, but that's a word that suggests uh, any kind of large sea creature. Ancient Jewish tradition thought it was a monster, a sea monster, actually. So, uh, but you've got this great fish, and then there's a reference to the cattle and the livestock in Nineveh. And then there's the worm. And the very last phrase in the book is, and the many animals that are in Nineveh. Shouldn't I have compassion on Nineveh? It's got 120,000 people who don't know what's what, plus all the animals. It's fascinating. In the book of Jonah, the only beings who do exactly what they're supposed to do all the time are the animals. <laughs> the prophet doesn't, and the other people, you know, the Ninevites, the sailors, they've been pagans, and uh, they turn, but um, anyway, uh, even in that story, here you have an example of things from the deep who are, they, they praise God not but with their lips, with their words, with their minds, even 
They, they praise God in, in the sense that they do what they were made to do. They do what they were made to do. And the same thing could be said about the sun, the moon, and the stars. They do what they were made to do. And in a way, that's going to apply to us. That's ultimately the way we ought to praise the Lord, by doing and being what we ought to be, doing what we ought to do. So uh, there's the, the, the first fierce environment is down in the deeps. Then verse 8 is another fierce environment up in the clouds just above our terrestrial sphere. Fire and hail. So fire could be lightning. Uh, and hail, sometimes fire is formed by lightning, of course. Snow and clouds. So, so the stormy wind fulfilling his word. Now, these things are, are not within our control. They are not. Now, we, we can try to regulate it a little bit. You know, we can fly, nowadays, we can fly a plane into the clouds and seed it and try to get it to, to rain a little bit. But we cannot create hurricanes. Uh, we, we can create tornadoes in a wind tunnel, but we can't just make them appear in Kansas, you know. Uh, there, there's talks now about trying to build massive barriers in the Midwest to slow down tornado advancement. Uh, whether that will work, I, I don't know. But these are, the point is, these are things beyond our, our normal control. But in a sense, they glorify God because they demonstrate that there's a power greater than us. That makes us think about uh, the power of God. That's even beyond that. But they do what they're made to do. They fulfill his word, you know. That is the command of God. God has a purpose in his sovereign plan. It's not that they obey the Bible, right? It's not that they're obeying the Bible. It means that they're... They're fulfilling the sovereign plan of God. Uh, now we come to verse 9, and we get down onto the earth itself. We're getting much closer to our home now. Verse 9, mountains and all hills, fruit trees and all cedars. So uh, here is uh, paired together some extremities of the mountains, the, the great outcroppings of rock, and then the lower ones. In a way, these things make us look up, don't they? they? They remind us that there are things greater than ourselves. Just by their being there, they're a testament to a, a power greater than us. And then there's the things that we have more, greater access to in the end of verse 9. Fruit trees and all cedars. So the fruit trees, these are cultivated trees. These are the things that we get our hands in. We create orchards. You know, like in Jerusalem, there was the Mount of Olives, so named because they had cultivated olive trees all over the place. Well, yeah, our hand was on that. But they still glorify God. We didn't make those out of nothing. God is the one who created uh, those. Remember Genesis 1 talked about uh, the, the, tree, the tree with the fruit and the seed which was in it and all of that began by him. The cedars, these are generally wild growing trees and, and they speak of uh, God's power and they're, they have great use to us when we can harvest them but they're his creation. And then verse 10, now we start to get to living beings. So remember the first call to praise at, back in verse uh, 1, verse 2, called on living beings. And then it was non-living things. And now we've been talking about more non-living things. And now finally back to living things, to living creatures in verse 10. Beasts and all cattle. The difference between beast it means wild beasts. These are your lions and your elephants and your bears and things that you don't uh, domesticate. I know, I know, we have them in circuses now and then, but uh, you know, you don't you never tell anyone, I'm a bear farmer, you know, you just, <laughs> it's not what you do. But uh, you've got cattle and, and, and the like, those are domesticated animals. And, and by the way, it's fascinating that even in Genesis 1, there's a distinction between those kinds of, even before there was sin, a curse in the world, there are animals that are best left to be to do their own thing, beasts of the field, and there are cattle, which are intended to be useful. So uh, within Eden, no, uh, Adam would have uh, trained domesticatable creatures to help him in his work there, and then he leave the other one. The other ones aren't going to attack him, but just you know, let the gazelles do their own thing. Don't put a harness on them. Uh, but all these kinds of animals and what they do, the way they may help us, the way they, the way they may roam free and do their own thing, uh, these testify to the glory of God. And then even in the middle of verse 10, the creeping things, which is not restricted to snakes and lizards, by the way. Um, this is a, a word refers to small land animals. So, I mean, this is squirrels, uh, rats even, um, badgers, uh, the, the small wildlife. 
all the way from you know mammals like that all the way down to insects uh, these things which crawl close to the ground crawling things might be a better way to translate it uh, and then winged fowl all of the many different kinds of birds uh, the ones who fly and those who don't all of these things are a testament to the praise of God and again these are living things, but unlike angels and unlike us, they don't have minds that they can consciously praise God. There, there's a few times in the Bible where animals are given a voice. <laughs> well, one, anyway, there's a donkey, uh, and, uh, and that's just for a moment. That's a miracle for a moment. It's to, it's, remember, that's the story of, of Balaam. Balaam, who was esteemed as one of the great pagan prophets of the ancient world. He's even referred to in uh, texts outside the Bible supposed to have great insights into the spiritual world and he can't see as, as well as the donkey can uh, that there's an angel <laughs> in front of him. Um, but uh, generally speaking, these are not creatures that speak or even think in the terms that we do, but they praise God in the sense that they do what they were made to do. And now we come to verses 11 and 12 and it starts to really hit home. Kings of the earth and all peoples princes and all judges of the earth. So here, you know, you've got the highest people in authority and all the people under them, and, and every kind of person you can imagine. Princes and judges, there, there is no human position that puts you above God. Unlike the Egyptians and later the Romans who their kings fancy themselves to be gods. That's not the way it really works. No one is above the Lord. In fact, the Lord is the one, the Bible says, who raises one up and puts one down. He is the ultimate king. And it works all the way, all the way through the political strata, princes, judges. And then verse 12 spreads it out even to ordinary people, uh, young men and virgins, boys and girls, old men and children. All kinds of people here are included. There's, there's nobody exempt from the obligation to worship God. Everybody is under uh, command to <coughs> recognize his worthiness uh, and to give him praise. And this give him praise that we're not talking about just sort of some sort of a token, oh yeah, I believe in God, yeah, no, no, no. We're, we're talking about the orientation, the whole orientation of our life is to be around the majestic king of all things. And now here's the reason that's given. You know, the, the first half of the psalm gave a reason why should, why should the things in the heavens praise God? Well, he made them by the word of his mouth, and he sustains them. Uh, well, now, look at the reason that's given here. It's a little different. Verse 13, let them praise the name of the Lord. Why? Number one, for his name alone is exalted. His glory is above earth and heaven. So he has a glorious supremacy that is over heaven and earth. You know, if you think about the places we've been as we've read this psalm, we've been in some pretty amazing places. Sun, moon, stars, out in the universe, swirling around in our atmosphere, down in the lowest depths. I mean, uh, this, is, this is the stuff of a, some, you know, of, of a nature show, you know. Uh, sometimes they're pretty impressive watching the BBC Earth, planet Earth sorts of things where they take you into all these mysterious places, places sometimes where the human eye has never been. And you think to yourself sometimes, why does that even exist? And, and the theological answer is because it pleases God. The theological answer is because it pleases God. Uh, but God's supremacy, he's above both of these realms. That's a reason that everyone ought to praise him. And then there's another reason given in the beginning of verse 14. His gracious deliverance for his people. Verse 14, and he has lifted up a horn for his people. Praise for all his godly ones, even the sons of Israel, the people near to him. Lifted up a horn. Now this is not talking about music. This is not a, uh, uh, he's not pointing now to the instruments. Uh, think of an animal horn. Uh, think of an animal with a horn. Think of rutting season. Let's take a ram. This is my ram. One ram here, another ram here, and you know how it goes. And eventually, one of them whimpers off, and the other one does what? 
sticks his horns up high because he's one. That analogy is often used in the Bible and other ancient writings to talk about the conflicts between nations. There's this collision and crunching and someone goes skulking away, sometimes in defeat or in the captivity. The other raises its head up high in victory. In terms of warfare. Uh, well, it could be warfare, that's most often, but it could just also be circumstances. So the idea is that the Lord has brought deliverance for Israel somehow, whether, you know, this could be about being released from Babylon and going back. I mean, the Lord, the sovereign God, did that through human circumstances, yes, but the Lord caused the horn of Israel to be lifted up again. And this is, it says, praise for all his godly ones. That is, this is a cause for praise for his godly ones, for the people who know him and love him. This is reason for them to give him praise because he's done for them what they could not do. Uh, and the sons of Israel, and that doesn't exclude the, the daughters either. This is just the Israelites. There are people near him. The Lord cares. There, there, we, there is a people in the earth that the Lord gave special attention to. It doesn't mean that he didn't love other people either, but there was a special plan that God had for Israel. And yes, they were beat down and knocked down, always you know, in judgment for their disobedience, but the Lord has a plan to bring them back up. And throughout the Old Testament, we see the, their horn being raised up. And, and I think on into the New Testament, you see the ultimate plan for restoration is through, uh, through the Messiah. And uh, all of this is reason for praise. And so then the psalm ends with the conclusion, another universal call to praise the Lord. Verse 14 is a command in the plural. Hallelujah means y'all praise. All of y'all. All y'all yeah. <laughs> praise the Lord. And that's, you know, the psalmist is really more worried about us praising him, that our lives be oriented around him. He's not worried about the sun, the moon, the angels, and the goats, and the sheep, and the snakes not doing their thing. They're going to do their thing. He's kind of imaginatively pointed his baton at them, but ultimately where he, needs, he gives the most attention is to us. No matter who we are, how great we think we are, how great other people think we are, no matter what our age, no matter what our status in life, our life is to be oriented around him because he's the one who made us. He's the one who sustains us. He's the one who shows his kindness to us. And so he is worthy. Well, let's, uh, let's close in a word of prayer. Our Father, we're thankful for the time we've had this morning to be in this very rich psalm of praise. And while it's full of commands, it's also full of joy. For it makes us think about your power and your purposes uh, and your great grace. We thank you that we have uh, come to know you, though, uh, though we may not be ethnically of the house of Israel, we have come to experience the mercies of the God of Israel through your Son. And so we give praise to you, our God, and ask that you would help us by your Spirit to live lives that are oriented completely around you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.